praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is so right, guys. You always do such a great job inspiring us and doing, yeah, teaching us. I just saw my life. Oh. Just go through. Oh, my goodness. Me Worker. Yeah. When I was trying to make it, I can tell you, young folks who listening, if you're listening, <laughs> if you have had children and you divorced or they're dead, you can make it. Mm -hmm. God took me through with five children. Mm -hmm. Wave maker, miracle worker. They didn't miss a meal. Promise keeper. They didn't holy know they were cold, but they were. Holy, holy, God, holy. Miracle worker. He is. He Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's a promise keeper. He promised us. Mm -hmm. If we stuck with him, what he'll do for us. He, he did. He promised us that. We got to live on what he said. But we got to believe him. But forget all that. But forget all that. It's nothing compared to what he's going to do. <laughs> That's obvious. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Wonderful blessing of the Lord. Hey, thank you. Hallelujah. That's a good word. Good word, Bill. Good word. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Doing awesomely. Um, I, I don't know if you guys will remember because it's been really uh, a little while ago that we... Uh, that we, well, it was actually in March is when it actually was. We started a series called The Hurt Locker. Yeah. And uh, it was right before COVID and all that kind of stuff. And I had preached one message in it. Uh, well, it, and it took two or three uh, services to do that one, one message. But, but really basically one message, and that was the fact that everybody hurts. And it was really just an, an effort to show us and to kind of get us in the flow of the fact that we all have hurts. And, and, and because of those hurts in life, it causes different uh, reactions in our, in our mentalities, in our uh, even physicalities with uh, addictions can be caused by a lot of these things, depressions, anxiety, stress, uh, just all kinds of things can happen when we take this pain and we bury it inside of us. And I describe the place that we bury it as being a hurt locker, that inside of all of us, we have a hurt locker where we place our hurts and, and our desire is that they would somehow go away and that they would not have to be hurting us anymore and dealt with. And uh, we, one of the points of that message was that if we don't deal with these hurts, they, they never go away. They, they just, they, they lie there and they fester and they continue to hurt and they cause reactions many times that we're not familiar with why we would react this way. And I use Simon Peter, you might remember, and Simon was not the best of the best and, he, and Jesus chose him and then he, he followed the rabbi Jesus and then Jesus said, hey, I'm going away. And Peter just, Peter just completely overreacts to that. I mean, Jesus has been saying that for a long time, but, but this time when Jesus said, all right, I'm, I'm going away, but I'm, I'm gonna leave the comforter with you and I'm gonna come back and get you and blah, blah, blah. And Peter says, this will never happen to you. You remember this? This will never happen to you. And Jesus has to look at him and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, if Jesus called me Satan, that would be a, that'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? I mean, might hurt my feelings. I mean, knucklehead, maybe, yeah, but 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 Satan, um, and 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 then the reason that he did that, we examined it, uh, and the reason that he did it was because uh, he had this tremendous inferiority about himself because. He was not chosen to, to be the best of the best by a rabbi when he finished whatever schooling he had had. He was sent back to the fishing business with his dad. So he was a nobody, you know, a commoner. And Jesus had made him a somebody. Jesus had elevated him to a disciple and with the prestige of that. And Peter had been seen everywhere with Jesus. Wherever Jesus was, there was Peter. Peter was there when he healed people, when he did miracles and all these things. And so now Jesus says, I'm going away. And Peter starts to see what he's going to be like when Jesus is gone. 
And of course, his response is an overreaction because of the hurt that he has placed in his hurt locker when he was not chosen for the team. When he, when he was second string, he didn't make it. Uh, and it put a hurt in him, and, it, and, it, and that hurt festered. And, and then it manifests itself. Well, this is just an example of the way all of our hurts do. Uh, you have to deal with these things or else they don't go away and they end up causing reactions and issues down the road that many times the people around you would go, where did that come from? What in the world was that? All I said was, and you know, some little line and man, they just tore you up about it. Well, it comes from the hurt locker. Everybody has one. So today I'm going to kind of continue. I stopped that when we went into COVID because I really wasn't sure how long we would be in COVID. But since we still are, yeah, since we still are, and I've already preached about 12 messages since that time, went all through the greatness series with David, you know, and so I'm coming back to the hurt series right now is what I'm saying to you. And, uh, and we're going to look today at the hurt healer. We'll look next week at the hurt whisperer. We'll look at what Satan does and how he does his thing and all of that is really, I think is really very interesting and, and, and uh, um, it helps us to see how our enemy operates and, and what he does to introduce these things into us. But we're gonna look at today the hurt healer and of course the hurt healer is the way maker, the one for the light in the darkness. You know, that's my God, that's who you are. Jesus is the hurt healer. And, and to start with, I want to use uh, two passages of Scripture that are both from the Old Testament. And both of these passages are what is called messianic prophecies. Now, a messianic prophecy is, and there are 400 of these, a little over 400 of these prophecies in the Old Testament, just so you'll know it, the Old Testament's full of this. A messianic prophecy is a prophecy that speaks about Jesus coming or his uh, way of death or the way he's going to live or what he's coming to do. It's just an Old Testament prophet that has a word from the Lord that says, Jesus is coming and here's what he's going to be like when he comes. And the first one comes out of Isaiah 61. And, and, and notice what it says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. This is, now, this is what Jesus is going to do when he comes. Isaiah is saying, the word of the Lord has come to me, and, and this is what Jesus is going to be about when he comes. To preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn to console those who mourn in Zion. Now Zion is the city of God, Jerusalem. So he said, all of you, all of you Jewish people that are mourning in Zion and weeping and you're in trouble in Zion, Jesus is gonna come and he's gonna console you and he's gonna comfort all those who mourn to give them, and these are beautiful lines, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old rule, uh, ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. So Isaiah 61 is telling us basically two things. Number one, God is interested in every area of your life. Your, 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 your mournings, your brokenheartedness, your poverty, you know, your, uh, uh, your weeping, your, the fact that you're in bondage. I mean, the Lord, God, God is interested in every area of your life. God loves you and God desires and cares about every area of life that you are going through. And he knows what you are going through. And the second thing it tells us is that Jesus, well, in, in this day it was it was a prophecy, it was gonna happen, but we know that it did happen. But Jesus died on the cross for us so that we can live in absolute freedom and absolute victory from every weapon that the enemy may throw at us. Mm -hmm. Now that's good news, isn't it? 
that you might live in freedom and you might live in victory over every weapon that the enemy might throw at you. That's, that's the gospel, man. That, that, that's the good news of life, that because of the grace of Jesus Christ, God has given you victory. It's not, it's not that you've earned it. It is by his mercy and by his grace that Jesus gives us this and gives us these victories, but that's what Jesus is going to be about. And then he describes also five types of people that Jesus is coming to heal. And when I say heal now, and I'm going to say the word heal all through this, and if you have the notes, you see it's written all, all through here. And don't just think I'm talking about healing your physical body of some kind of sickness. I'm talking about healed from everything, all kinds of things, emotionally, spiritually, physically, um, uh, psychologically, uh, every, every kind of hurt and everything we need to be healed in life. So anyway, there are five kind of people that Jesus are coming to heal according to Isaiah 61. The first one is the poor. In verse one, he says, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Now there are several definitions of poor, right? I mean, you could be, you could be poor in lots of ways, right? One would be you could be spiritually poor. And we all know that being spiritually poor is actually the number one problem that we all have, right? So Jesus is coming to heal our spiritual poverty. Another type of poor is the one we think about when we see something about being poor, and that is financial poverty. I don't know about you, many of you, you, you look like very prosperous people, but uh, I... Yeah, I um, I uh, look sort of, but I was brought up in, in, in a pretty good amount of spiritual poverty. I, I was brought up in a very uh, poor situation in life, and I can just testify that uh, that I know the uh, I know the the humiliation, if you want to say it that way, of, of poverty. Uh, if you were reared in poverty, you know it. The insults, you know. Those little biting remarks, the insinu the insinuations, yeah. You know, the the the, the condensation, you know. Look, just just uh, it creates some emotional and, and psychological scars, I think, that um, to think that others are enjoying things that you can't enjoy, I mean that's really a very, uh, a very torturous place to live in in life. And I don't know why, but there are some people on this earth and there are even denominations of um, religious people. I'll, I'll stay away from the word Christian, but, but there are whole denominations of religious people on this, on this earth who, thinks that, who think that poverty is, um, is a blessing. And I, I'm thinking... If you think that poverty is a blessing, yeah, it makes you closer to the Lord, I think is their thought pattern about this. But I'm just thinking, boy, if you think poverty is a blessing in life, it's because you, <laughs> you've never lived in poverty. That's why you think that. Because poverty is a curse, guys. It, it really is. And Jesus came to break the curse of poverty no matter what kind of poverty it is, Jesus came to break that curse of poverty and to heal the poor. Second kind of folks, he said, are the brokenhearted. In verse one, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, betrayal uh, breaks your heart. Rejection breaks your heart. Loss, especially of people that you love, breaks your heart. So Jesus said, I'm not only coming to take care of those things that hurt your heart, but I'm coming to take care of those things that break your heart because I'm coming to bind up and heal the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. Third was the captive, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Many types of captivity, right? Yeah. Many ways you can be bound. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Well, I had, all, I had a lot of bondage when I came to the Lord. I came to the Lord when I was 16 years old out of a family that nobody in the family even knew Jesus. The only time I ever heard the name of Jesus was around Christmas time or something. 
And I'm going to tell you that I was full of all kinds of bondages when I came to the Lord. Jesus says that he is coming so that we can be completely free from every bondage that is in our life. And, it, and, it, and, and when he says be free from, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have to ever deal with any of that kind of stuff anymore. Because we all know as long as we're on this earth, we're going to have to deal with things that would enslave us, right? But what Jesus is saying is that although you have to deal with those things, I'm going to take those, I'm going to make victory over those things completely possible for you. And when I look back 48 years ago, when I first came to Christ, and I look at what my life was like back then, and I look at what my life is like right now, I mean, even though everything's not perfect and I could probably name four or five things I'd like to be better and blah, 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 I can say to you that looking back on my life 48 years ago, the only way I can say it and describe it is uh, I'm free. <laughs> I'm, fr I'm free to think like I need to think. I'm free to live like I need to live. I'm free to be who God created me to be. Why? Because Jesus has come to break the captives free. All who mourn is the next group. To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. Mourning, the word mourning means legitimate grief. As opposed to the word moaning, which means <laughs> feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm go I I've come to heal those who mourn. And the word mourn here is a word that indicates a, a tremendously uh, heavy uh, mourning that, that really creates in, in, in those who have it uh, a, a, a real sense that, uh, that, there, that there's, just, there's, no, there's no way out. It just produces hopelessness. It's the kind of mourning that just makes you feel hopeless in life. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. You can replace those ashes, you know, that the Jews did when they, when they put on sackcloth and ashes and they threw the ashes in, their, in, their, in the air and, and just covered themselves with it as a sign of intense mourning. He said, I'm going to give you oil. I'm going to give you beauty for those ashes. And I want to give you the oil of joy for, for all of that, that, that mourning that you have. And so Jesus said, I'm, I'm coming to heal all who mourn. And then the last one is uh, those who have a, heavy, have a spirit of heaviness. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. What is the spirit of heaviness? Well, the spirit of heaviness is uh, a spirit of darkness. It's a depressive spirit. It's a... It's a, it's a binding type of spirit. It's a, it's a, you know, just a heaviness in our life, a darkness in our life. Why would, why would darkness in our life be a problem? Well, that's where the enemy pushes us. And the reason the enemy pushes us is because that's where he works. Satan is the what? Prince of darkness, Right? It's his domain. God works in light. The enemy works in darkness. So the enemy is constantly pushing us toward darkness so that in the darkness he can come up and whisper accusations against God to us. So Jesus said, I, I need, I'm coming to heal that spirit of darkness. Clinical depression, you know, uh, depressed spirit, dark spirit, uh, heavy, heavy inside of us. You know, clinical depression usually comes from some, for, from some biological reason, right? Um, blood chemistry disorders and things like that, uh, physical, biological things. But, you know, sometimes depression can be caused by uh, being absorbed with yourself, Right? I mean, focusing only on you, getting all wound up in what's going on, how it's going on, um, how you've been mistreated, what you've been done, rehearsing all the ills that have happened to you over and over and over, those kind of things. 
being self-absorbed can also bring that spirit of heaviness in our life. So what does Jesus say he's going to bring and give us for the spirit of heaviness? He said, I'm going to give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. When you feel this heaviness coming on you, just begin to praise. And that praise is going to push the darkness away from your life. I I guarantee you, you cannot be self-absorbed when you're praising the Lord. That's all I'm going to say to you. And Jesus said, so I've come to deliver you from all of these bondages in life so that you can be set free. So how you doing? Uh, Do any of these describe you? (laughs) Oh, we got, got any of them that you might be dealing with? Now, I'm not trying to say that if you do, that you're lost, that you don't know the Lord and that you've never invited Christ into your heart. I'm not saying that you're not going to heaven when you die. I'm just saying that even as a believer, even as a solid Christian, you can have some of these areas in your life that you are dealing with uh, many times in your life. And these areas of life are the areas that keep us from going forward and living the way that God has designed for us to live. Having the kind of families we would love to have, the kind of life, the kind of job. The kind, I mean, these things hinder our life. And Jesus said, that's one of the reasons I'm coming. Now, here's another messianic prophecy. This is Isaiah 53. By the way, Isaiah has lots of messianic prophecies in it. Isaiah really told us a lot about Jesus. But here it is in Isaiah 53, uh, and he's talking about what's going to happen when Jesus dies on the cross. That's what he's given us the message about. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. You've heard this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, the word peace here, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Comes from the Hebrew word, and this is not going to surprise you, shalom, right? Shalom is a Jewish greeting, and many times they also use it when they depart from each other. Shalom, 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 you know. And, and, and people just uh, uh, briefly describe shalom as meaning peace, Like, oh, peace to you, peace to you. Yes, peace to you, my friend. Shalom, shalom, shalom. But that's not what shalom means. Peace means basically an absence of um, an absence of trouble or or an an absence of uh, of uh, conflict. Shalom literally means all blessing or every blessing. So when you say shalom, you are literally saying, I pray that God would bless you with every blessing. Not just the absence of trouble, but that every blessing of God would be yours. That your life would be filled with the blessings of God. What, what in the world would that, would that mean? Well, well if, 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 if you can be healthy, but you're living in poverty, and you don't have all the blessings of God, right? Or you can be rich, and you can be living in poor health, and you don't have all of the blessings of God. What I'm saying is, I don't want 90% of the blessings of God. Do you? I I mean, I want 100% of what Jesus came to give me. And he said, I'm, I'm coming that, and I'm being crucified on a cross, I'm being chastised, I'm being beaten, I'm, I'm going through all that I'm going through so that you can have 100% of everything that I came to give you in life. Now you saw, how many of you saw the movie The Passion of the Christ, right? All right, you saw it. You saw what happened to Jesus, right? Now, and everybody knows that, I mean, that's just as, as bad as they could make it and we could live through it. I mean, it, it, was, it was way more terrible than that. 
Now, because we could still recognize that he was a man. <laughs> but the prophets said, uh, you're not gonna even be able to recognize that he's a man hanging on the cross. There's a piece of meat hanging up there. But this verse in Isaiah says that Jesus was beaten. The be uh, let me interpret it this way. The beating for our shalom the beating, the word chastisement means beating, right? To be chastised means to be beaten with that cat of nine tails and, and crowned with the thorns and, you know, I mean, roughed up, beat up. What does this verse say? The, the beating of Jesus was done for our shalom. The chastisement of our shalom was upon Jesus and by that beating we are healed. With his stripes we are healed. So Jesus said, look, I'm not only interested in the fact that, that you get delivered and that you can, uh, you're going to heaven when you die. I'm coming so that your life can be blessed with every blessing that God wants you to have and that I can bring into your life and I want, and, and, and the beating that I'm gonna take and you're gonna see me take is so that every blessing can, be, can come into your life and by this beating, you're gonna be healed. Healed of what? Well, fill in the blank. Healed of, of poverty, healed of, of, of spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual blindness, emotional bondage, heaviness, broken heart, uh, uh, whatever it might be, just fill in the blank. Whatever the devil tries to put on you or whatever he tries to bring in your life that used to be there before you got saved, now he's trying to bring it back on you. Well, if this is true, then why aren't Christians healed of all these things? We have some, right? Now remember, I'm talking about all kinds of scars and hurts. I'm not just talking about the fact that you would have a physically well body. What does the scripture teach us about divine healing? Well, let's just look at one of the places where Jesus did it, all right? John chapter five. This is a complete account of exactly what happened when this, when this guy was crippled, he couldn't walk, he was laying at a pool and Jesus comes by and sees him. And then let's look at what Jesus did. Uh, John 5, verse one. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. That means house of mercy. Having five porches. Well, you would expect this. Five is the number for grace. I'm not gonna get off into all that. But when you see five just think, uh-oh, something graceful is about to happen here. Had five porches, and in these lay a great multitude of sick people, impotent people. The number four, by the way, and I just can't resist this. The number four means worldly, all right? There are four descriptions of sick people here. Look at them. They're impotent. The, 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 old, the King James says, use that word for sick, impotent. What does impotent mean? Impotent means not able, right? I'm not able. So what am I? I am worldly and I need a touch of the grace of God. All right? And then he said blind people. All right? What does blind mean? I can't see. You know anybody that can't see? Can't see their need for salvation? Can't see their need for Jesus? Can't see the sin in their own life? What are they? Worldly. What do they need? Touch of the grace of God. And then he said that, that some of these people were, uh, let's see, were lame. What does lame mean? It means they can't walk, right? All right, sitting here, every one of you look as good as everybody else, right? If you couldn't walk, when would your deficiency show up? When you had to stand up and walk out, right? So when we're called to walk for the Lord, then our deficiency shows up. And what, is, what causes that? I'm worldly and I need a touch of the grace of God. And then paralyzed means withered. And what does withered mean? It means dried up. 
It means I, my, my spirit is dry. My soul is dry. I have no joy in my life. What's wrong with me? I'm withered. I, I, I'm worldly. Anyway, there you go. That's, a, that's neither here nor there. Forget that. Waiting for the move. These are the people that were laying on the five porches waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity, a weakness, a sickness, 38 years. Holy smokes. <laughs> Slavery, by the way. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, so Jesus sees him and knows he's been there for 38 years. Omniscient. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> it means you know everything. Jesus looks at him and he knows that he has been laying there for 38 years and then he's going to ask him this question. Do you want to be made well? What is Jesus doing? What kind of question is this? He may have been there 38 years trying to get in the water and he hadn't gotten the water yet and he's still laying there. I mean, is Jesus mocking this man? Is Jesus making fun of him? Well, no, there, there's a reason. But he asked him this question, you want to be made well? And the sick man answered, sir, I, don't, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. You know, that's going to be a problem, right? Yeah, the Jews are watching. That's, that's going to be a problem about healing on the Sabbath. But, but let's just go with it right now, all right? So in this passage, you see three truths about divine healing, all right? Truth number one, healing is not just an act of God. It is a partnership between God and us. Healing is not just an act of God. It's a partnership between God and us. Hey, the angel came down and stirred the water. That's God's part. You have to step down in the water to be made well. That's your part. A partnership. God has a part, and you have a part. And this man had been there for 38 years, and Jesus knew that he had been there for 38 years, and yet he asked him the question, do you want to be made well? Why in the world would Jesus ask this kind of question? Well, do any of you know anywhere in the Bible where Jesus healed someone or did anything else beneficial in their life against their will? Did Jesus ever save anybody against his will? Did Jesus ever heal anybody against his will? Did Jesus do anything beneficial for somebody against that person's will? No, I can save you some time. Don't waste your time. He never did. Now, there, are, there is some evidence that Jesus didn't do some miracles because of people's unbelief. The, his hometown of Nazareth, Jesus didn't do any miracles there because the people that lived in that town didn't believe. It said because of their unbelief. They knew him. That's Jesus. He went, to, uh, he went to Nazareth Elementary School. I know him. I played ball with him on out of Little League. Uh, uh, they were so familiar with Jesus, they didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. And, it, and, and, it, and, and he didn't do a single miracle there because of that unbelief. And then there was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, Sir, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, easy, go sell everything you got, give all the money to the poor, come follow me, and you'll be saved. And the Bible said that the rich young ruler went away sorrowful, for he had much riches. He didn't go away saved. He didn't get saved. Why? Because he didn't obey Jesus. And so this partnership has a part for us and a part for God to do. Like the two thieves that were on the cross. You remember them? One of the thieves looks over at Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus said, you're going to be with me today in paradise. And then he turned to the other thief and said, hey, whether you believe or not, you have to go to paradise with me. No, he didn't say that. The other guy didn't believe. He didn't go to paradise. Only the one that believed went to paradise. I'm just saying that Jesus will not operate contrary to your will. Jesus never saved someone, healed someone, or did anything beneficial in their life against their will. Healing is a partnership. When God comes to heal our life, it calls for a response from us. Jesus didn't just walk up to this man and say, I'm sorry you've been laying there for 38 years. Get up and walk without having any interaction with him or asking him anything or finding out anything about what his will was. You know why? Because Jesus knew that if this guy was going to get healed, it was going to cause him to have some responsibility. What, would, what does healing cause us to be responsible for? Three things that, he is, that, 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 that healing requires from us. A, obedience. Do you want to be made well? Well, it's going to require something from you. You've got to get in partnership with God. This is not something, God's not sending a lightning bolt down there just out of the clear blue sky to, to, to heal your life of whatever it might be. It's going to require something of you. It's a partnership between you and God. So it's going to require obedience. Jesus tells this man, rise, take up your bed and walk. He rise, take up his bed and walk. The rich young ruler didn't do his part. He didn't get healed. In order for Jesus to heal our life, we have to obey him. Jesus is going to do the hard part, but we have a part that we must do. We must obey. Lots of people are waiting for a lightning bolt kind of healing in order to be, to be healed in life, but I'm just telling you that you're not going to get one because healing requires a, a partnership between you and God, and you must obey. That's one thing. Second thing you, you're required to do is you've got to change. With change, the issue is that you can become so familiar with your problems that you would prefer to live with your problems than to change. Your addiction is so well known to you that you would rather stay in your addiction than be responsible for the change that has to come in your life in order to be set free from it. Your poverty, your bondage in life, you can become so familiar that being free sounds scary to you. Because it means if I'm free, I got to change. I got to change the way I live. I got to change the way I talk. I got to change the way I walk. I got to change lots of things about my life if I get saved. So sometimes people prefer to stay sick rather than their lives to change because they're familiar with being sick. They know how to be sick and they're scared to be well. Then the third thing it requires is responsibility. I gotta be obedient, I gotta change. That's why Jesus asked him, you wanna be made well? Or do you want me to do this? It's your option. Do you, do you want me to do this? I'm not going to do it if you don't want me to now. Because you know that if I do this, it's going to cause some requirements on, in your life. You're going to have to obey. And then your life's going to change. You're not going to be able to lay down here. Let me just get talking about this on responsibility. All right? If I get healed, I'm going to have to take responsibility for something. Right? If this man gets healed... He's going to have to go back to work. 
He ain't been working for 38 years. You know what he's been doing? He's been laying down there by the pool of Bethesda and merciful hearted, kind, gracious people have walked by and have seen him in his distress and have given him resources to take care of himself. He has been, he has been living off the goodwill of people for 38 years. Getting up and taking up your bed and walking means that you're going to have to take responsibility for yourself. It's easier to stay a victim, right? Man, if I stay a victim, then other people will take responsibility for my life. But if I quit being a victim, now I've got to take responsibility. Before any of us can be healed of anything in our life, we must stand before Jesus and accept the challenge of partnership with him and tell him that we want to be healed. I want to be healed, Jesus. I am poor. I don't want to be poor. Heal my life. I'm sick. I don't want to be sick like this, Jesus. Heal my life. I'm, I, I, I'm full of bondage. I'm full of grief. I'm anxious about everything. I'm depressed. I'm stressed. I'm, I'm all out of shape. Jesus, heal me. I don't want to be this way anymore. I'll take responsibility. I'll obey. I will change anything in my life. I'm going to do, you do your part, which is the hard part, and I'm going to do my part, which is the easy part, but it is still a part, and I'm going to obey, and I'm going to, and I, and I want you to heal my life. And the dilemma that believers have in being healed from these things is that many people are professional victims. That's all they've been all their life. They want to be healed by a lightning bolt or a magic prayer at an altar down here. In other words, immediately, they want to be immediately healed. Now, I'm not saying that God can't immediately heal you. God can do anything he wants. God can hit you with a lightning bolt, but it probably ain't going to happen. He can, he can heal you. You come down here and I say, Lord, heal this person. He, he, he can do that. that God, God can do anything. Like when, he, like when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Hey, resurrection is immediate, right? You don't kind of halfway resurrect anybody, right? You either resurrect them or, they, or you don't, you know? Yeah, it's kind of like being kind of pregnant, you know? <laughs> you're not kind of pregnant. You either are or you're not. But God works through a partnership and he works through you agreeing God doesn't waste time with professional victims. That's just all I'm saying. He doesn't waste time with professional victims. Do you want to be made well? So I asked the guy that. So first, the first truth about healing is it's, a, it's not just a God thing, it's a partnership. Second, second truth, healing is not just an event, it's a lifestyle. Many people are waiting. They're waiting to be healed immediately, like I said, lightning, but and, 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 and never gonna happen that way because healing is most often, and I want you to listen to this now because, I, I, listen, I've been in the ministry for 46 years and I have been in every kind of imaginable situation with people with their lives, with their sicknesses, with their bondages, with their attitudes, with everything about them. And I'm telling you, what people want is people want to be immediately, miraculously, magically healed. But I'm telling you that that's not the way healing normally happens. God can do anything and don't go out of here saying, Pastor Key said God can't heal people. No, we have it on, we have it on, on film here, or, 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 or digits, really, <laughs> whatever it's not film. We have it on digits. I did not say God cannot heal you like that. I'm just saying that he, he, often, he often doesn't. Healing often is a process in which we learn to live differently. Remember, the road to recovery is a road. It's not a couch. 
There's a reason why they call it the road to recovery. You got to walk it. You got to go down it. You got to get on it. You got to get on it. You got to choose. It's, you don't walk over to the couch and sit down. That's not the road to recovery. When God heals your marriage or God heals your addictions or God heals your finances or God heals your family, it is a process in which you learn to live differently. Let me show what I mean. I'm, let's continue with John 5. It doesn't end there. You know, it ended with, and this day was the Sabbath, which we said that's going to be a problem. Well, let's just see. Verse 10, John 5. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, um, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the <laughs> one of the Pharisees' rules about the Sabbath day. You can't work and carry in your bed. You're working. Okay. He answered them, "Well, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk." They asked him, "Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk?" But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So in other words, this thing happened so fast and so quickly, and this might surprise you, there was nothing distinguishing about Jesus that you would remember. In other words, he looked like common man. He, there was nothing beautiful about him. There was, you, he just blended into the crowd. That's why when, when the guards came to get him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas had to kiss him because he, he, they couldn't tell which one down there was him because he was so plain and, and ugly and whatever else. That, you know, it, I mean, he, he couldn't say, man, it's that guy with that beautiful hair right there. Get him. That's, that's him. No. He had to go kiss him so they'd get the right one. Well, this guy didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus didn't come up and say, I'm Jesus, and I'm going to heal you, you know. The guy said, all he said to me was, rise, take up my bed and walk. And, and I did it, and then he just disappeared into the crowd. I don't even know who he was. Verse 14, verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more. Oop. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. This man evidently had some problems with sin in his life. I mean, if he didn't, Jesus wouldn't say, hey, quit living that lifestyle that you've been living. That sinful lifestyle you've been living is, uh, is making you sick. So you, you've been healed now, right? All right, don't go back to that sinful lifestyle. If you do, you're going to get sick again because... Whatever you were doing is tied to your sickness in some way. All right, let's talk about sin for just a, for just a second. Because I want to kind of get rid of a, a, a vision that's, that a lot of people have about, about God and sin. God does not sit up in heaven every day waiting for you to sin so that he can put the hammer on you. He doesn't have to. Because sin... Has its, has its own consequences. For the wages of sin is death. That's a consequence. Now, be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap rotten flesh. That's a consequence. If he sows to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's a consequence. So God does not sit in heaven angrily waiting for us to, to sin so that he can punish us and get us in line. God loves us. God doesn't just love us when we don't sin. God, God doesn't quit loving us when we don't sin and then love us back again when we do sin. God has eternally which means forever, forgiven our sin and loves us in spite of what we do. Do you believe this? God loves you 
If you have come to Christ and ask him to save your soul and surrender to him in your heart and wave the white flag and said, Jesus, you are the master, the Lord of my life. I lay it down. I give it up. Whatever sin happens in your life, it has already been eternally forgiven by a loving God that will never bring judgment against that sin. The sin has its own consequences. I'm not saying that you won't have to suffer some consequences because you will because sin has consequences, right? I mean, if it wasn't for the consequences of sin, sin would be fun, right? Now you, look, y'all don't be acting so spiritual out there. I don't know what you guys are looking like on the internet out there, but these guys right here are trying to look holy. They look like I'm the only one that has any sin in his life. Man, you guys know. And that sin has consequences. So you'll suffer the consequences of sin. And if, it wasn't, if, if we didn't have any consequences, sin would be the great, greatest. You know? I mean, it's fun. That's why God has to tell us don't do it. If it wasn't fun, he wouldn't have to tell us don't do it because we wouldn't be doing it. But we do it because it's fun. But it carries its own consequences and so there you go. And you can't do anything to make stop God stop loving you. That's why Hebrews said that when you have a problem, come boldly under the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If God had not forgiven you and if God does not love you and God's not trying to punish, he could never say, hey, anytime you need me, just come boldly right into the throne of grace and you can get some help before it's too late. So, healing is often a change in lifestyle and you don't have to be perfect to be healed, but you do have to respect the temple of your body. Often healing comes when we stop abusing our body. What do you mean, pastor? Eating the wrong things, drinking the wrong things, abusing our body. The stress, the anxiety, no rest. Abusing the temple of the spirit. Many times healing comes when we just stop abusing ourselves. And we live a different way. All right. So healing is not just a God thing. It's partnership. Healing is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Here's the third one. Healing is not just focused on relieving our pain and problems. It is focused on redeeming God's eternal purpose for our life. If I'm sitting in on Bethesda, full of sin, God comes to me and says, why, you need to be saved, and my question is, why should I change? What would God's answer be? Or, if I'm living a sinfully wicked life, and I'm hearing a message like this, and this message is saying, you gotta change. You would be saying, why should I change? If I have an immoral lifestyle, or living contrary to the things of God. Why should I change? Well, the answer is so that God's purpose for your life might be fulfilled. You say, well, I want to change because I want fire insurance. I want to go to heaven. No, 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 no. What it's about is it's about God has a purpose for you. God created you for a purpose. In your mother's womb, he designed you. He put you together. He gave you the personality and the mentality and the, and, and, and the drive and, the, and, and everything you needed to accomplish what he had for you. And sin stops you from accomplishing that which he has for you. Let me, let me read, read uh, Isaiah 61, back to it. Uh, middle of verse three and verse four, just to remind you. Uh, G, G said, or Isaiah said, he's coming to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Look at verse four. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. 
Who is they? They are saved, healed people. And they are going to be helping other people who are not saved and healed. Healing redeems the purpose for which you were created in your mother's womb. How many of you remember at least the first two principles of experiencing God? Number one, God is always at work around you. Number two, God invites you to join him in what he's doing. God's always working whether you see him or not. And he, he, and he wants to invite you into what he's doing. You, no, you don't invite him. He invites you. You don't start doing something and say, hey, God, I need a little help over here. No. God says, come over here. Let me show you. Come, oh, I need you. I need you. What, why would God need you? God needs you because our lives have been redeemed in order to help redeem the lives of others. Your scars, the, uh, the areas of your life that have been so damaged by pain. Your scars have far more power than you can ever imagine. You know, you, you, I've, I've heard about the anointing all of my life. The anointing, the anointing. You got to have the anointing. Pray for the anointing. I want the anointing. And then, you know where the anointing comes from? Out of your scars. The strongest flow of the anointing of God in your life will come out of those areas in your life where you have been damaged and hurt and God has healed it and strengthened it and you now can strengthen others with the same strength that God gave you when he healed you. Yeah. Do you know what a person like that is called to somebody who needs them? A safe harbor. People need a safe harbor harbor. A safe harbor is a person who's been through what I'm going through and made it. Yeah. Look, when, when, if I, when I talk to alcoholics or I talk to uh, cocaine addicts or I talk to sexual addicts or whatever it might be, they listen to me most of the time because I'm the preacher and they, you know, they want to be polite enough to listen, but it doesn't make a lot of difference to them. Even I can tell them every detail. I can, I can, I can sue them. I can give them facts and blah, blah. And they'll just be sitting, yeah, yeah, pastor, I know. And they'll be sitting there looking at me going, this is such a good man. I know he cares about me and he's telling me right stuff. I, I wish I could do what he's saying here. Yeah, that's what they're thinking. You let somebody who's, who's been as addicted as they are and they know it and that person chose to leave that lifestyle and you let that person come up and say, hey, John, man, I've been, I've been wanting to talk to you. You know, I, I, I was, I, boy, I know just how you feel. I was right there. And, and I'm telling you, uh, you can be set free of that, man. You don't have to live like that. And then his question to, to, to him would be, uh, is it boring? When I get off of drugs, is my life going to be boring? Because that's what he's thinking about. He's thinking, I can't live without drugs. Drugs are my whole life. Life would be so dull and boring and I would just go away. I don't want to live like that. You, would it be sport? No, man. I'm telling you, that's just the way you, those little drugs are making you think. That's not the way it is. I'm a safe harbor. My scars are now flowing anointing yeah, yeah. on that one that is hurting like I hurt that needs to be assured that somebody has made it through and if I made it through, he can make it through. Right, right. There's hope for me. There's hope for me. So the reason God heals you is not so that you won't have any more pain or problems. The reason God heals you is so that you can accomplish the purpose for which God has yeah. created you. Yeah. And when you'll start praying about it that way and looking at it that way, God, I don't know what's going on with me, but whatever this is, I, 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 I want to be healed. God, I, I, I say yes. Do I want to be made well? I want to be made well. 
I'm agreeing. I, 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 you know, and, and, and I, I'm going to do whatever it takes, God. I'm, you and, you and me and you, we in partnership. What, whatever it takes, God. Whatever my part is, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And, 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 and I'm just saying, I want to be healed, and I'm with you. And whatever it costs me, whatever responsibilities, however much I have to change, whatever I have to do, God, I want to minister to the people that you have for me to minister to, just like you ministered to me. I want somebody else's life to change as much as mine changed when you did something than in me. And that'll be the greatest reward of any life in this place. You'll never forget it. I guarantee you, if God uses you to affect somebody else's life and you know God did it, you will never get over it. Every time somebody says, does anybody have a testimony? You'll jump up on a seat and be saying, I got one, I got one. And then next week you tell the same one. You just won't ever get over it. It's the most thrilling, exciting thing that you've ever experienced in life to be used by God to affect the lives of others. That's why we're here. That's why when you get saved, God doesn't just kill you and take you on to heaven. He leaves you here to make a difference. Right, so he can use you. And he will. But sin hinders that. And you say, why should I stop? Why should, I, why should I stop sitting? Because it hurts you. It's not the right way to live. You live in financial sin, that's not the right way to live. It hurts you. You live with a sinful mouth, that, that's not the right way to live. You hurt other people and you hurt yourself. That's just not the right way to live. And God says it'll hurt you. So, let's bow your head.